I got an audience. There are certain teams that make a difference in people's lives. For a lot of us, it was the 1984 Detroit Tigers. Champions of the organization for the fourth time, but the only team that I can recall as a young kid, and I cheered them all on. And we've got three starters on our Facebook live chat as we lead you up into game three of the 1984 World Series of the Tigers and the Padres on Fox Sports Detroit tonight. The ace Jack Morris, Dan Petrie, and Milt Wilcox, all world champions. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us. Hope your friends and your family are safe and well. And Milt Wilcox, a happy birthday to you, my friend. I don't think we want to hear us sing it, but uh, we should make sure everybody knows that it is your birthday. Let's start talking about this team a little bit because it is truly one of the more special teams, I think, in baseball history. It was, at the time, just the third team to ever go wire to wire. The 27 Yankees and the 55 Brooklyn Dodgers. Jack, did that add some pressure, do you think, for your team when you hit the postseason? I really don't know as though we ever understood what pressure was. You know, we were a bunch of younger guys that were just having fun playing the game. We all went to spring training. I think we'll all agree with that. With the absolute purpose in mind, we are determined after how we had played against Baltimore the year before and where we ended up and where they ended up. And, uh, you know, it just was one of those years where it was our time and we knew it and we knew we had to prove it. But every day was a lot of fun. We we figured we'd have a new hero every single day. Dan, when would you get a sense this team was special? Well, I mean, it was pretty hard not to know that something was up when we were 35 and 5, you know, and really in spring training, I mean, we had a we had a horrible spring training. I mean, and and I think it was just a matter of record-wise, I think it was just a matter of everybody just getting their work in and, you know, I'm not sure you know, the three of us, you know, pitched in that many of the so-called A games, you know, I mean, we were certainly ready to start the season, but Sparky wasn't putting a whole lot of emphasis on spring training, but we got out of the gate so quick and, you know, and, and kind of the goal that we set for ourselves. And I think that's when, right when we said, uh oh, I mean, this is, uh, this is, uh, this is something special, but, you know, we didn't run away from the Blue Jays until the very end. No, these yeah. guys, for the most part, oh. all together. You had been in postseason play before. You knew what it was like in a World Series. Did you have to tell these guys and kind of give them an idea of what it was all about? You know what? It was 14 years since I was in the World Series. So I, it, and I was a young 20 year old kid. So I didn't know too much about it. But um, no, I, I think I think Sparky kind of kept the pressure off of us. You know, he was he was the one that talked to the media and and kept everything going. And you know, we had some veterans on the on the club and. We were having, like Jack said and Dan, we were having fun. I mean, it was a it was a fun year, but I think when we knew we could do it was the last the two years before. Mm. I mean, in eighty one we just barely missed. Eighty two we were close. Eighty three, I mean, we were down to the wire with uh, Milwaukee. Remember, we went into Milwaukee and and we if we'd have swept three games there, we would have been in the playoffs that year. So we knew we had a good team. It's just we got off to a great start in eighty four, and it just kept going. Fellas, what was the level of, I'll use the word surprise, that you faced the Padres instead of the Cubs? Because so many people just thought it was Chicago and Detroit. We were headed for a Midwest showdown. Milt, we'll start with you. We'll go reverse order this time. Was there a level of surprise at all? Uh, yeah, it was. I think it was. You know, we, we just felt like we were going to play the Cubs. You know, we heard all, the Cubs people in Chicago were saying, oh, the Tigers, the only reason they're here, you, they got off to a great start and you know, we played solid all year. We'll beat them in the World Series, and we heard that. I mean, you know, you can't say we didn't hear all that stuff. I was I was geeked to play them, and I think Jack and Dan probably was too. Dan, what do you remember from that that National League Championship Series if you were paying any attention to it? Well, I I mean, you know, the thing about it, I think most people were rooting, you know, for the uh, for the Cubs. You know, they wanted to see Detroit in Chicago, and I remember, and guys, I think you probably will too that. You know, we had we had to have a suitcase packed, and you know, San Diego won. We had to get down to the ballpark in about an hour to get the flight to go to San Diego, and then if Chicago won, um, they were coming, and we were going to open in Detroit. So it was very unusual. I think it had something maybe to do with the the lights, you know, the lights, you know, or the lack of lights. But I just remember it was one of those situations where we weren't really sure where we were going. But I remember reading a lot of things that everybody was really hoping to see 
a Chicago Cub Detroit Tiger World Series. Jack, what did you know about the, the Padres before the series began? Well, I knew some of the names. Obviously, Tony Gwynn was the National League's best hitter, probably. And, you know, the veterans that they had with Goose and and uh, Craig Nettles and Bavacqua and, you know, uh, Steve Garvey, they had some they had some veterans. And I remember hearing all about, well, the Tigers are young and they have no experience and none of them played in the World Series except the birthday boy right next to me here. But uh, it, it, it was, uh, for me, it was kind of funny because – I assumed we were going to play the Cubs, and uh, I was looking forward to the rematch of, what was it, the 45 World Series, Tigers and Cubs? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, everybody around Detroit that I knew were, were talking about the rematch, right? And uh, I was so nervous I took a nap uh, and waited for that <laughs> game to end, and I woke up when my wife told me, hey, get ready, you got, you're going to San Diego. I was surprised. I really thought that Chicago would be coming to Detroit, but uh, – we went to San Diego, and and uh, probably I, in my heart of hearts, I think we probably played the easier of the two teams. What was the level of confidence that you get the ball in game one, and we just watched it on Fox Sports Detroit Sunday night, uh, three two win for you, Larry Herndon with a big two run homer, Alan Trammell with a big uh, game as well with a couple of hits. What was the level of confidence in your mind going into that game one? I had a lot of confidence because I knew my guys were going to score. All of us, every game, it seemed like we would take the mound uh, on a road game with a lead. I mean, Tram, Lou would get on with a base hit. Tram would somehow score him. And it was just one of those teams uh, that we were going to score runs. I, I was very confident of that. Uh, you know, I remember hearing about Alan Wiggins. This guy can fly and he's going to bunt on you and you're not going to be able to field your position. I remember. Uh, Dick Trzewski gave me a pep talk. He says, if, he's, if he bunts on you, you're going to tag him out in the batter's box. And I almost did that. I really tried. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it was uh, – we just – we were we were so geeked and ready to go that I don't think there was any stopping us. Dan, this team took the lead in every playoff game you guys played. You went 7-1 and one when you scored first. And on the year, 85-17. and 17, And at the time, that's the third best – in American League history, what does that what did that do for you guys as a pitching staff when your team is constantly getting to the early lead? Well, you know, I, I was you know everybody talks about that thirty five and five start, and I, I believe it was we won our first seventeen games to start a season on the road, and I, I just remember early in the year like that that you go into a city. And everybody's still full of a lot of excitement and saying, hey, we got a shot this year and everything. And, oh, no, here come the Tigers. They're off to this great start and everything. And that's pretty much the way it went. You get the first at-bats on a visiting uh, opposition or opponent's ballpark, and then Lou gets on, Tram knocks him in, you know, Gibby gets up, knocks him in. It's two to nothing before, you know, they, the, the, the opposition even gets in that bat. So it was pretty – it, it was a lot of fun to be a part of just knowing that, like Jack said, you knew that they were going to score runs for you and to go out there and just for them just to go, oh, man, it's the first inning. And it was almost like, man, this how are we going to beat them? You know, this, they're, they're, you know, they're up two to nothing already. So it was it was a fun time to be around, and, and especially with that offense grinding like it did. So, Jack, you took the ball in game one. Dan, you got game two. Milt, you come back to Tiger Stadium for game three, and your number's at home. Okay, of your 17 wins, 11 were at home, and your ERA was just incredible uh, at Tiger Stadium. What did you enjoy most about pitching at Tiger Stadium? I love center field. I mean, <laughs> you, you could give up a long, long ball to center field, and and uh, we had Chet Lemon out there that would just run down everything. I mean, that's what I loved about Tiger Stadium. And, of course, Sparky made sure that the infield was soft, and there was no ground balls going through. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I was a ground ball pitcher, basically. I got a lot of ground balls. I kept the ball down, moved it around. And I used center field to my advantage. I, I mean, I give up a lot of long fly balls. You know, I could give up a home run just like everybody else. But a lot of my balls, uh, you know, center field, left center field. And in that ballpark, you got a lot of uh, area there where you can make a mistake. You know, I'm interested to know, Dan, in game two, Kurt Pavaka goes yard. He hits a couple of homers in the game and he does the gesture all right the gesture of 
blowing kisses to the fans there at, at Jack Murphy Stadium. What was your reaction to that? And, and what was your team's reaction in general? Well, I mean, I, I think I was more upset, obviously, that you know, the pitch that I threw where I threw it. And it, you know what? I, I, I'll tell you. I mean, you know, there's always somebody that becomes a star, it seems like, a, a lesser-known player. Although, you know, Kurt Bavak would have been around a long time. But, you know, you, so many other names on that ball club that you that you knew of. And, you know, so it was his time and, and, and he had a wonderful series. And if you remember, guys, that San Diego, that crowd was absolutely electric. I mean, they were loud. And, you know, I mean, you hit a big home run like that, you know, off the, I mean, you know, let's face it, we were, you know, oh, the big, bad Detroit Tigers. And after Jack stifled them in game one, I mean, that was a big blow. So, you know, I... Uh, you know, you never want to see somebody celebrate, obviously, but, uh, you know, it was a big moment for him in front of their home crowd. So, you know, you got to you got to let him have a little bit of fun, too. Do I like it? Of course not. But I mean, under the circumstances, it's a big deal for him. Jack, don't yeah. you think Gibby kind of responded and helped his teammate a little bit later in the series? Yeah, it's a team sport. You know, it really, truly is. And uh, I don't think there was anybody worried. You know, we went in San Diego. You win one game, and we don't have to go back if we take care of business at home, right? So that was our our uh, our motto, I think. And we, we just were a confident group of guys, and I don't think there was anybody going to deny us. Hey, Milt, was there a, a, a different sense of confidence with this team? You got 53 wins at home, more than any team in the majors. Was there? And, and I know every team usually is better at home than they are on the road, but was there a different sense of confidence with this club at home? Well, I don't know if at home, we, we just had a lot of confidence. I mean, you know, you have to look at our starters and our bullpen. I mean, we had guys in there like Jack. You know, Jack was going to go out there. and The problem with Jack is that most of the time when Jack uh, played or pitched, he always drew the, the guy on the other team that was the best pitcher. Mm -hmm. So he's going to have to shut him down. Dan got the second best, and I usually got the third best. So I was it was a little easier for me because I didn't have to pitch against the, the better pitchers. But – we had a great team. The offense was great. Who's going to beat our defense? Mm -hmm. And our closers, Lopez, Senor Smoke, and Willie, uh, nobody could stop those guys. You know, it's interesting. We were down in Lakeland, and, and Dan, Jack, and I have talked about the young pitchers coming up. You know, we've talked about Scooble and Mize and Manning and Fiedo and, and the competition they have within their own room. Did you guys have that same competition? What was that competition like, Mel? We did. I, I, I think I, I, I tried to compete against Jack and Dan. I, 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 you know, I, if he goes out and shuts him out, I want to try to do the same thing. I mean, it, it's a very competitive sport. You know, even though we're on the same team, you know, I don't want, I don't want Jack to win 25 games and me 12. I mean, you know, I, I wanted to win as many as they did, and I think they felt the same way. They're going to go out and do the best they can every time, and, you know, we're, we're, we're confident people. I mean, you know, and we never really had any problems in the clubhouse, but you know, sometimes we, you know, at a long season, things are going to be said, but we were very confident and we just wanted to win and, and do the best we can. Dan, how did those guys help you? How did that competition help you as a starter? Well, you know, I said it when, when Jack made the hall of fame and when he had his number retired at Comerica park and they asked me to speak and I said it, I mean, Jack set the standard and, and he said it, he set the standard years before 1984. I mean, it was, you know, when I'm I'm still a young guy, Milton certainly had a nice career up until that point and had some really good years, but I'm still kind of building into uh, becoming a good pitcher. And, you know, I was okay, but still young and still learning. And that's what, what you know, Jack and Mill, I mean, but Jack set the standard of which to, to follow. And that's why it was a big deal. I, I remember I was thinking about this today. Guys, I don't know if you remember this, but Sparky had set the goal for us to win 55 games. You know, somehow if, you know, Jack, Milt, and Dan can win 55 games, we're going to be in really good shape. And he took us out to <laughs> I-4, and the speed limit at the time was only 55. And so he had the three of us stand by a sign that had 55 miles an hour, and that was the thing that they ran in the paper. And as it turns out, you know, with Jack's 19, my 18, Milt's 17, we came up one short with 54. But uh, 
He was he was a genius. He, he darn near called it. Jack, did that uh, that competition, that friendly competition within your your pitching room, help you at all? And how? If so, how? I think it helps everybody. To this day, I think it helps. You know, I I talk about it in the clubhouse with the current Tigers. Yeah. We knew for a fact. Here's the deal: we weren't pulling against each other. We wanted them to go out and do their best. And then it was sort of like top that one, you know, and. and you, you hand them the ball and say, okay, it's your turn. Now go out there and top that. And I think that's what builds team camaraderie. I really, truly believe that. And, uh, you know, the, those are two other guys, uh, Milt and Danny, they, they don't get the credit they deserve because uh, that year was truly a team sport. Uh, we went out there and everybody contributed every night. Milt hit it on the head. Our bullpen was really solid. Uh, I took it upon myself to try to make sure they had their rest when I pitched. Uh, but you know, that's just me. That's the way I was wired. And, you know, I, I felt uh, embarrassed if I came out of a game and had a, have a reliever come and finish up uh, as I got older, that changed. But, uh, during the 84 team, uh, every one of us could have gone out on one night, you know, Milt almost threw a perfect game. And, uh, you know, I, to this day, I, I say, how the heck did that not happen? You know, and, uh, it was just magic. I shook off Lance. Is that what it was? <laughs> That's the problem? That was the I issue? I hear that. Every time I see Lance, I hear that, believe me. <laughs> remember that pitch you shook me off? I'm going, yeah, I remember Lance. You'd have to tell me all the time. That, that was a big deal for him, right? I mean, it, Jack, it was special that he caught your no-hitter. I mean, catchers take a lot of pride in that, right? Yeah, I mean, they're our battery mate, right? It's like yeah. they're they're a part of it. Uh, they call the signs. We, we have the right to shake, but – when you're in tune, and the other guys will admit it too, when you're in tune with that catcher, you don't want to ever shake. You want it to be, all right, you're on the same wavelength. You understand what you're trying to do. You're trying to execute a game plan. And uh, Lance Lance was a man's man. I mean, he he put in, put us in our place when we needed it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> one time he came out, he looked me right in the eye, and he said, you suck. And he walked away. And it's like, wow, that was great. That was really great. But he got my attention. Did he do that to you too, Dan? I mean, you're a great storyteller. And is that is that one of the the the, the matchups that you have with Lance Parrish and some of the uh, I don't want to say confrontations, but long discussions, heated conversations that you might have with some of your teammates? Remember, you know, uh, I, Lance and I only got into it one time. He most of the time he would come out and. He'd just come out into the mound and he'd, he'd bring up, you know, we grew up about five miles apart in California. So he'd bring up his home city or my home city or something like, hey, I wonder what everybody's doing back in Diamond Bar where he grew up or something like that. But we got into it in, in, in midway through 84 because uh, I did shake him off one time and we got into it in the clubhouse. And of course, Lance would have broken me in two. And thank God he uh, <laughs> kept us cool. Um, but yeah, we, we, we got into it a little bit. But uh he got my attention, as Jack said, and, you know, I, I, I learned from it. And, uh, you know, it was just a matter of him wanting me to throw my fastball more. And, uh, you know, he got my attention and it certainly helped me out. Mel, that, to me, that, to me, that to me was the ultimate competitor. I mean, you had a lot of guys with, well, uh, very type A personalities, if you will. How do you think it meshed so well? And, and you got a story or two for us regarding uh, some of those exchanges you may have had with some of your – your world champion teammates. Well, I was just going to tell the guys, and, and I'm sure that Lance did this to them too. You throw a pitch and you don't you shake him off or whatever, he'd take about two steps in front of home plate and throw you a rocket back yeah. to him. <laughs> Hurt your hand, and he'd kind of sit there and look at you and just turn around and you go, oh, oh I just pissed off Lance. You know? <laughs> but uh, yeah. I, I mean, I, then we had to, if the guy's stealing, we would have to get off the mound or get down because he's throwing a laser down to second base and he doesn't care. He's going to take your head off if you're in the way of it, you know, but he was, he had a lot of, he had a lot of confidence himself and he was a proud guy. And, um, but you know, with other guys, no, I don't think we really had too many instances where our teammates, we got into it with our teammates in the clubhouse. I don't re really remember too much. Wow, that's surprising to me. I mean, just because Jack and Dan have told me stories about Daryl Levins, a little bit of a pot stir. Gibby's that fiery personality, right? Jack's a fiery personality. Chet's fun-loving, you know, and, and isn't afraid to, to snap at people once in a while. You're trying to tell me you guys got along as well as a family could when you're staying that much time together? 
I thought we did. I, I don't really remember. I mean, there's a couple of instances, you know, but nothing big. I don't really remember anything big. Jack and uh, Dan may. I, I, I'll just jump in right away. And I, I don't think Sparky would have put up with any of that. And I think you, you saw that in years after 84, when there was a little bit of friction between a couple of guys. Um, next thing you knew, they weren't around um, <laughs> that next day or that next week. So I think he knew that he put together certainly a very, very good team, he and Bill Joy, But, you know, he also put together a, a group of guys that, that got along together, rooted for one another, and and that was a, a, a big reason for our success. Guys, when you look at when you look at what Alan Trammell did in that World Series, he batted 450, he batted 419 in the playoffs, proved just how great he was. Lance Paris had big homers. Larry Herndon, we mentioned with a big home run. Gibby had a couple of memorable homers as well. Wasn't that what, what was the the dynamic, the characteristic of that team that you played uh, that, that was the same as some of the other great teams you played on, guys? I didn't play on very many great teams. <laughs> I had We had a couple, but, you know, when I was at Cincinnati, right. of course, they had some really good teams over there. But I didn't play on a lot of great teams. I mean, we played, we had some good teams, but not like the 84 team. I know Jack's been on some great teams, and, and so did Dan. So. Yeah, I, I just – Remember, when I think about our – and it's not 84 alone. It's the 80s Tigers that I remember. And, you know, it was it was Lou and Tram that set the table every day. You could depend on them every time you needed a ground ball, you needed a double play. If you could roll onto one of those guys, they'd get the job done. But they were also on base, creating havoc all the time. And then the other guys that you just said, Gibby and Lance and Larry Hearn and Chet, you know, even Tommy Brookins, Daryl – they were all there to be kind of the, the spotlight guys for the big swing, right? They, they were going to hit the bombs. And they, they, they did their share of other things well, too. But it was, it was Tram and Lou, I think, that really kind of set the tone for the Detroit Tigers. And then, you know, of course, we had the ball in our hands, so we had to make sure that they didn't score. Mel, tonight we get game three of that World Series. The series is tied at one. Yep. You had mentioned, you know, that there's, you know, you're very confident with your ability, confident in your team going into Tiger Stadium. What's the mindset? What did you learn from Jack started in game one and Dan starting game two about San Diego that maybe you didn't know? Um, well, of course, I didn't pitch like Dan and I didn't pitch like Jack. So, you know, when you have team meetings and you go over the hitters, they tell you a certain way to pitch. But we all pitch so much different that we pitch our way anyway. Um I knew they had a great team. They had a lot of guys. You just didn't let – you didn't want their guys on the front of the order getting on base. If you could keep Wiggins and uh, Templeton and some of those guys, uh, uh, Tony Gwynn, you could keep those guys off of base. I felt like you could pitch to Garvey, Nettles, uh, the catcher. I can't remember what his name was. But, Terry Kennedy. Uh, yeah, yeah, Terry Kennedy. I mean, they had some really good players on that team. It wasn't like they were – they, you know, they weren't a can of soup. They, they were, there was a lot of stakes in that, that lineup, you know. Yeah. So you had to be able to do that. I think where we really controlled those guys was our pitching. You know, our pitching held those guys down, and their pitching wasn't quite as good. And I think that's when our, our hitting and our guys really came through. Somebody must be walking on your property. Make sure they Yeah, my, my, somebody's walking with one of their dogs on the property, and my dogs are inside going crazy. Uh, tonight, Fox Sports Detroit, 8 o'clock, Tigers and Padres. Gentlemen, I don't know if I've ever asked uh, Dan and Jack this, but I'll ask it now. I'll start with Jack. Did you? Re when did you realize what this team meant to this city, this state, and Tigers fans all over the place? I think we all kind of knew it when we were young, even before 84. Uh, because we heard so much for so long about the 68 Tigers, and I'm sure the current Tigers are so sick and tired of right. hearing about the 84 Tigers, and I, I've told them many, many times, just go win. You know, we're ready for you to win. Go win. You know? uh, and that's the one way to kind of pass the baton. But I, I think we realized from the K-Lines and the Hortons and the guys that were around the clubhouse, uh, Trzewskis, that played with those guys – how much this city loves baseball. And uh, 
it didn't it wasn't it wasn't just 84 we knew it before then at least i did and i i just knew that if we could win you know we're going to be a part of of their memory forever dan when did it hit home for you you know i i just remember and you know how things in society have changed so much with social media and and, and things but back you know back in 1984 all that long time ago i mean you know, we could go out and, and, and you could go to a, a mall or go to a restaurant and you'd go around and, and just the way that you were treated as you went around the city and then as you went around the state. Remember the, the press tour that we had when we go around in the wintertime and the buses and make all the little stops and they still do the same the same tour now. But it was just you you knew that sense. And I knew, you know, coming from California. Um, it was before I moved here full time that, you know, I'd come back in the winter, not really knowing what a winter was like and snow and cold and ice and everything like that. But to see the excitement and the way that they were treat they, they treated us on that press tour and then during the season and then the wave and the beach balls. And it it just became a big, big party. And as many years as it's been since, you know, um, the, the, we had the 35th reunion and the way that everybody was greeted and the way that everybody was pulling for Jack and Tram and they're pulling for Lou to get in the hall of fame. I mean, yeah. it's almost yeah. like it's, they take it personal that when Jack's not in there, when, when Tram's not in there and doggone it, we got to get Lou in there now. So, you know, I think there's a lot of reasons right there that, you know, um, where it tells you how, how special this team is to people in Michigan and the city of Detroit. Milt, was there a time yeah. in your season or maybe in your career, even after the career that you had, that you recognized how important you were for this city? No, you know what? The, the people in, in Michigan and the surrounding areas really take baseball serious. You know, and Jack hit it on the nose. You know, we got tired of hearing about the 68 Tigers. I mean, they had a great team, but that, we heard about them all the time. They're always bringing these guys back. And, and I'm sure, like Jack says, the guys nowadays are, are the same way. You know, I, I was kind of hoping in, what was it, 2006 when they got into the World Series? I was really hoping they were going to win that, you know, to kind of not get us off the hook, but to, you know, advance, get another group of guys in there. So, but, you know, the people in Detroit and around that area are just so special. They're just great sports fans. And they, they live and die Tiger baseball. I can walk down into Fort Myers, Florida. Or Naples, believe it or not, I'll walk down and walk the streets, and somebody will say, aren't you Milt Wilcox? I mean, I'm 70 years old, right? I haven't been playing baseball for 35, 40 years, and they'll know who I am. It's a pretty amazing deal. Yeah. Is that what it said on your cake today, Milt? 7-0? Is that what it said? <laughs> yeah. I changed it from 7-0. I moved it around to, z double, to zero seven. <laughs> it, you know, it's amazing, guys. We see the comments made by folks on this Facebook live chat as people get geared up for game three of that World Series on Fox Sports Detroit. And the people just saying it meant everything to them. You know, it does my soul good right now. Eric just sent in a note. Thanks a lot, guys. I mean, it shows you the impact you still have on people today. How does that resonate with you, fellas, real quick? Boy, Jack. Well, you know, I, I've been so lucky. Uh, started in Detroit. And quite honestly, I never wanted to leave. It just was circumstances that uh, I had to make a decision with my career. And, you know, and then it just, I had the, I had that uh, fox or the rabbit's foot with me the rest of the way. Everywhere I went, I was on good teams. I was so blessed. But, uh, you know, winning is something that, that fans love, you know, and it, it gives you an idea what communities and sports teams mean to their community. I, I've always said this. I think, we reflect on our sports teams, no matter where in the country we are. Yeah. We'll say they're us when they're winning, right? That's us. We're winners. And when they lose, those guys stink, you know? <laughs> and, and it's just, they're a reflection of us. And, and that's why winning is so important. Dan, real quick, what do you say to the fans yeah. who are watching this right now? Yeah, I can, I can say Michigan has meant everything to me, obviously. I grew up in California and, and my wife, too. And we've lived here full time for, I think it's 35 years now or something like that. You know, so this state and this city means everything to the Petrie family. Milt, final thoughts on it? I, I agree. I mean, I love Michigan. I, I, I moved there. I moved from there about 10 or 11 years ago because of the winters only. 
and uh, moved down to Florida. But I, I go back to Michigan every year, spend a couple of months there, have a great time. I love the area, love the people. And one of these days, they're going to have another championship team. We hope it's real soon. Fellas, thanks for all the great memories. Appreciate the storytelling today. Folks, don't forget, game three, Tigers and Padres, the great 1984 Detroit Tigers, one of the greatest baseball teams in the history of the sport, taking place from Tiger Stadium right now on Fox Sports. Detroit. Bye, Jack. Bye, Dan. Hopefully we'll see you guys soon. Go get them. Bye, buddy. Happy you birthday, too. pal. Thanks, bud.